Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I love the enthusiasm this fine Sunday morning. Yeah. Welcome to House Church 2.0. Woo -woo. Woo -woo. Now, I know we all are acquainted. We all know each other. But just a reminder, if we do have any newbies in the house, what are these? Our visitor cards. That is what they are. Please encourage your fellow friends that come in who are new to sign one of these bad boys and stick them in the giving box back there. Just want to throw that out there because we want to stay connected with everybody who comes through the store and pray that they leave changed. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so as most of you guys know, we partner with the Rock program. Um, they assist in meeting the needs of our youth in our community and in our local high schools. Um, they have expressed that they need they have a need for belts for boys and girls. So new or gently used is completely fine, but if you guys have any extra ones lying around or if you feel led to maybe purchase a couple, definitely pray about it first, but maybe bring those in and partner with Miss Shannon. If you have any questions, she'd be happy to help you with that. Um, just any opportunity to give back to our community is something we wanna be a part of. Um, and lastly, we wanna just thank you again for your continued support in this ministry. Um, we really see God working. We just had a leadership meeting maybe last week or so, something around that timeline. And we're just really excited for the things we have in store this year. And we couldn't do it without your guys' support. Um, with that being stead, said, we do still have need for those to volunteer in certain areas, worship, kids, whatever it is that the Lord has put on your heart, tech we have a need for as well. Definitely pray about it first. We don't want people to just serve because they feel like they have to or they're obligated to. Definitely allow the Lord to lead you in that area. Um, and we also have... <laughs> I love that you put this on here. Our squishy room. We will have a squishy room launching. Well, there's a squishy cooking right now, and we're hoping to have more squishies coming into the ministry soon. Little babies, for those who don't know what squishies are. But we will need people to help us in the squishy room with the little tiny babies. So they are. They're just they're little squishies. Um, and lastly, thank you again for everyone who has continued to give in this ministry. We appreciate it. Um, it all goes to great causes in our community. And again, we couldn't do this without you guys. So we love you and we're excited for a great Sunday and hope you guys have a blessed week afterwards. Absolutely. Woo! Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. It is good. Yes, we could actually blame our dear friend Jamie for that one um, because she had said something about the squishies and after she said something about squishies, it just stuck with me. And I'm like, I love that because you look at the little ones and you're like, oh, man, I'm going to get hold of them. I want to hold them. Their little feet are squishies because they get the little wrinkly feet like a sharp A. I love it. I think baby feet are like my favorite thing. I love the baby feet. I don't know what it is because they're just like these little squishy looking little things and you just want to kiss on them and hold them. And now, now when they get older, it's like, now I ain't touching your feet. But when they're little, they're just absolutely... They're always squishy. Yeah, they're adorable when they're little. And then, then they find them and they're playing with them and stuff. It's just, it's amazing. It's the little things. Squishies. The little squishies. We love the squishies. Well, guys, thank you for being here today. It is uh, a blessing that you're here. Uh, for those that weren't able to make it perfectly, they'll, they'll catch the video and watch the video. Um, and that, you know, something today just kind of hit me. It's like, you know, we can make time for everything else. And we'll stay busy, 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 do, 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 whatever. Then the one day that we say we have off, well, it's always a Sunday. It's convenient that it's always on a Sunday, and that's the only time we can get anything else done. Um, now, again, I know things come up. I know life happens. I'm not, I am understanding and I am okay with just life happening. But when it's just poor scheduling, not so much. Uh, why? Because we're supposed to be disciples. We're supposed to be disciplined in our lives. We're supposed to be those things. And again, God has given us so much. Take one day to honor God. You know, honor Him in that. Whether it's, in, whether it's here or another fellowship, that's not the point. The idea is you take a day to honor God. Don't just take that day you have off and just fill it with whatever you didn't get done throughout the rest of the week. God gave us six days to work and to labor and to do the different things. Okay? One day he asked, honor the Lord. That's all. And again, it's not, I'm not trying to bring condemnation or anything like that, but maybe a holy conviction because I know God stirs in the heart of a, of a, of a believer to be there and to be in fellowship and to do that. I know he, he puts that in there because I don't know about y'all, even when I wasn't attending church like I should have been attending church, there was always that draw, man, I need to be in fellowship. I, I need to be connected with other believers. And it's like, even now, if we travel or go on vacation somewhere and we're going to be gone on a Sunday, we're trying to find a fellowship that we can be in. Even if we don't know the people, it doesn't matter. I just, I want to be around other believers. I want to hear the word. Uh, I mean, at the very least, I'm going to put on somebody I know that preaches good and I'm going to listen. Uh, you know, and I'm very particular about who I listen to for obvious reasons. There's a lot of crackpots out there. Um, they, they mean well, but man, 
wow, some of the stuff they get into, I just kind of like, I'm like, ooh, you probably should go back and read a little bit more. Um, but again, it's just, the idea is to get there, be connected, stay connected, be disciplined in that, because that's where you're going to find strength. That's where you're going to find encouragement. That's where you're going to be built up in your most holy faith, the Bible says. It's being around other believers. Why? Because there's accountability. A word that most people of us, we really don't like. I don't want somebody in my business telling me what I need to do or don't need to do or whatever. But the idea is that right there is what keeps us in line. That's what keeps us going. That's And if it's done in love, even if it's abrasive at times, it's going to grow us. Because why? Sometimes that abrasion has to happen to get the things off of us that should not be there. To make us better. To grow us in areas that, you know what? I've been kind of stagnant, but why am I stagnant? Well, one, you probably don't have no traction right now. You don't have no traction because you've been so smoothed off by what's going on. You got comfortable. Let's, let's get a little bit of abrasion here so you can get some traction and go. And, you know, someone that truly loves, you know what they're going to do? They're going to push. And they're going to push you. And they're not always going to be, hey, good job, buddy. And they're flattering you. And, you're, they're, you know, they're tickling your ear, making you feel better. They're going to be behind you. Hey, you're better than this. What are you doing? You're stronger than this. You have more in you than what you think. You have more capabilities than what you think. And they just stay after you. Why? Because they want to see you reach your full potential. And they don't want you becoming satisfied or comfortable because as soon as you get comfortable, complacency will kill momentum. Complacency will kill your drive to do anything to become better. Just as soon as you get complacent, I promise you, the devil will get in there and keep you in that place of, well, I can just keep doing this. It's okay. I'm fine. I got enough. As soon as you said, well, I got enough, that was a high, I got you now, because you'll never go above that. You'll never seek more. Uh, some of us, we, and I'm guilty of this, uh, not too recently, but I have been, to where I pray limiting prayers. What do I mean by that? God, I just want enough to take care of this, this, and this. Well, what does that give me room to do anything else with? Nothing. That gives me zero room, zero wiggle room to be able to go out and to be able to help other people, to be able to bless other ministries, to be able to give back to the community in a greater way. It's a, God, if I can just get this. It's like, God, you're the God of more than enough. So, Lord, I'm praying for not what just I need, but I'm also praying for other people's needs. And Brother Curry made a good point of this. He says, if God's going to supply all of your needs, what happens when their needs becomes your need? Right? Think about that. When other people's needs becomes your need, guess what God's going to supply? All of your needs. Right? And then what is he going to do? Now you have all of your needs supplied, so what? You can go out there and give because their need has become your need. Right? So that's the biggest thing, even as a ministry. Okay? We would like to bless his house for her. We'd like to bless the Rock program. Uh, we're eventually going to start actually giving back to Dominion Life uh, Church because what? They've poured into us. they poured into me which is ultimately poured into you, I want to be able to honor that. Why? Because they're putting out and they're worthy of what they get back. That's what the Bible talks about. But again, whenever that need becomes our need, we're going to have more than enough. And, and then again, that's just a kingdom principle. Most people don't think about it um, because they think, well, what's my needs? And they limit it to just their needs. But you start incorporating other people. Now we're blessing families. Now we're blessing the community. Now we're, you, you see, I mean, it's just a domino effect. That reaches out so much further than just our little bubble. What, what do we say? We want to be a river, not a dam. Right? We want God's goodness to flow through us, not just to us and get stuck. Okay? Because if it gets stuck, guess what? God's going to pull back. He's not going to pour any more in. Why? Because he can't trust you with what you got. It's not that he doesn't love you. He just, okay, this area you're not a good steward in. I'm not going to put more there because you're not doing right with it. we got two different parables on stewardship that Jesus gave. Okay, so just keep in mind, God loves us. It's not that he's judging us, but he says, look, if you can't steward it, I, you tie your own hands for me blessing you. But with that, let's go ahead and get rolling. Um, we got some things going on. Just lift up the body in prayer. There's been some recent events that's happened in the body. I'm not going to give full details, uh, but it's been some pretty harsh things that have happened recently. Uh, so just keep in prayer that God would bring peace. God would bring clarity. God would bring healing in those areas. Uh, like I said, I'm not at liberty to share all the details right now, but just know that, again, that the devil's been at work in families uh, causing some significant emotional issues. So we want to make sure that we, we hammer those things. Be praying for protection. Be praying that God's angels will be doing what they do, surrounding us, protecting us, watching over us. Um, even the loved ones that may not know God, we can still intercede on their behalf. 
we can still say, God, I'm lifting them up. They may not know you, but I know you. And because of that, I expect this. And they're like, well, you can't do that to God. I most certainly can. I'm a son. And my faith is what that is. Whenever I say I'm expecting something, that's not being rude. That's, I'm, ex I'm showing you this is my faith. I expect this to happen. So whenever you're praying for something, if you don't expect it to happen, why are you praying? <laughs> if you're not actually going to expect what you're praying for to happen, you might as well not even utter the words, other than it just makes you feel good because you said something. <laughs> I'm not trying to be harsh, but I'm trying to get you to grow in your faith. So when you pray, what? The Bible says, pray, believing that you have received, and it shall be yours. Not wait till it's yours and that prove that you have faith. No, you pray believing that you have it already. Then it shows up. Y'all order Amazon all the time. Do you have it in your hands yet? No, but you know it's yours. Why? I got a paid receipt. It says it's mine. And I got it better show up in that seven to ten days or whatever they tell me that delivery is going to be. And it better be free because I got Amazon Prime. You see what I'm saying? Our faith is exactly that. I have a paid receipt. His name is Jesus. So that paid receipt says paid in full that when I operate in my faith, it better happen. Because Jesus said it's the Father's good pleasure to give me whatever I ask for. Not in a selfish means, but you know what I'm saying. Like, what if I'm praying for this thing, I expect it to happen. If I'm not going to expect it to happen, I'll just keep a mouth shut until I get to that place. You know what? Hey, I know you have faith, that I'm going to come to you. But you can't make that always your go-to. Sooner or later, your faith is going to have to step into play. Okay, now it's good to go. For, if you know you're just mentally not there, and you're not just, you cannot seem to get yourself to engage, then go to someone else that can partner with you. But ultimately, the idea is that you have that relationship with the Father. That it doesn't matter what the devil throws in your way, you're still going to step up, step out, and do what you need to do in boldness and get the job done. Why? Because you're no different than anybody else. I'm no different than anybody else. What? We have the same God, the same Holy Spirit. We got the same power flowing through us when we act on it. It doesn't matter what your title is. The only title that should matter to you is that you're a child of God. That's it. It is an apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist, none of that. Believer. That's it. To them that believe, nothing shall be impossible. So, with that, let's go ahead and pray. We're going to get into this thing this morning. So, Father, thank you. Uh, we love you. We bless you this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth, God. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that leads us into all truth. God, I pray that your spirit would just fill this place this morning, God, that you would just touch every heart, every mind, every just the, the, the emotions that are going on this morning. God, I pray that you would settle them, God, because sometimes they are just like a storm. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I speak to that storm and the emotions. I say, be still. Before the Lord of hosts, you will calm down. And Lord, let your peace just settle in to the situations that are going on right now in families, Lord, the hurting, the pain, God. I pray that you bring healing. The sorrow for a night is okay, God, and we know that. But Lord, let that be all that it is, that it's sorrow for a night and that rejoicing comes in the morning, that there is a remembrance of the goodness of God. Even in the trial, even when the enemy is at his worst and being ugly and showing out, we still serve an amazing, loving Father. And that whenever the enemy does something like that, we're just going to go out and just prove even more that the kingdom of God is real. And we're going to take back the enemy ground, not what the enemy has stolen for us. So, Father, we just thank you. We bless you. We speak life this morning. God, we speak encouragement and building, Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we declare your goodness. We declare your grace this morning, God, and your mercy over these situations, Father. That where the enemy thought he could come in and tear up, God, you're going to come in and build up. Father, you're going to come in and restore. You're going to come in and just bring back everything that the enemy has stolen. And it's going to be multiplied. So, God, we thank you for the increase, God. For those right now, Lord, that are trusting you in their finances, God. That they are stepping out in faith in their finances. Whatever that looks like. Father, I pray that you bring multiplication, God. Because they're placing it in your hands and they're taking it out of theirs. So, God, I thank you for the multiplication that's going to take place in the finances. God, for the health. God, we are in a new covenant. You paid for that health at the whipping post. That we can walk in divine health. God, in the name of Jesus, I speak the health that you paid for by the stripes that you bore on your back and in your body for us. The blood that was shed to deliver us from that thing. You, you bore all of that for us. So God, that we didn't have to. So right now I speak health and life in the name of Jesus to the body, to the mind, to the emotions. That the devil no longer has a place in those areas. Because, Lord, your word talks about the salvation of the soul, which we know that's the mind, will, and emotion. So, God, that salvation is healed, delivered, set free, made whole, preserved. So, God, that it is complete in the way that you purpose it to be. So, Father, we just thank you this morning. We lift you up. We glorify your name in this place, God. Have your way. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do in this place. Speak to the heart. Speak to the mind. Change the lives that are here, uh, all of us, and wash us. 
with your goodness. Wash us with your spirit. Wash us with your power, Lord. Let the rivers of living water flow out of us this morning. So God, we thank you. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So we know that God is good. He is faithful. Even when it gets tough, we know that he is faithful. So uh, go ahead and open up to Hebrews chapter 12. That's where we're going to start at. Um, we're going to be covering a little bit of the Old Testament, a little bit of the New Testament this morning. Something that hit me this week uh, was, uh, and it's out of the, the Bible, but it, I was talking with somebody and it made me think how often this takes place in people's lives to where something that happens, a wound takes place and they get bitter. It begins to fester. That wound hits because it was a loved one or someone they trusted or someone they respected and looked up to. And all of a sudden that, that person or whoever it was that they had that feeling towards let them down or hurt them in some way because of selfishness on their end. And a, a seed of bitterness got instilled in that person, and they hang on to it. And what tends to happen with every seed that's planted, it will grow. Okay? And as that seed grows, it begins to impact everyone around you. All right? We've heard this saying, hurt people hurt people. Right? Why? Because they're hurting. The reaction is, I'm going to lash out. Whether I intend to do it or not, I'm hurting. I'm going to hurt somebody else. You try to get up against a wounded animal, and they don't know that you're trying to help, their response is, is to lash out. They're not necessarily trying to hurt you. They think they're protecting themselves. So in our, in our realm, that would be, hey, I'm trying to protect myself, so I'm going to hurt others to keep them at a distance from me. Right? But now one thing you've done is you've, you've passed on your wound to somebody else. It says, you know what? I'm going to take my wound to the Father who's already healed me of every wound. And I'm going to walk in freedom. I'm not going to allow this to hang on to me. But society seems to make it okay to stay in woundedness. Oh, that's okay. No, it's not okay to stay in woundedness. It's okay to acknowledge you've been hurt. Yes. It's just not okay to stay there. Okay? If I cut myself, I'm not going to say I didn't cut myself. I'm going to look at it and say, that really, that, that hurts. <laughs> I'm going to acknowledge it. But what am I going to do? I'm going to immediately, I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to bandage it. But what am I going to do? I'm going to move on. I'm not going to allow that thing to become my identity. What psychology says and what the world says, and unfortunately what a lot of churches say, it's okay. They allow people to stay in that woundedness for years. And then you want to talk about generational cursing. It's not so much a generational curse. It creates a generational habit. Why? Because the kids see what mom and dad did. Now they're imitating what they, we have mirror neurons in our mind. That's what it does. They, they will mirror what they see. Right? Y'all y'all seen kids that repeat what the parents say, and sometimes the parents look at the kid like, why did you say that? Because you said it, mommy. <laughs> I heard you I heard you say that. Mm. So it's again, it's something that we mirror. It's not so much that it's a generational curse because the Bible talks about that. God took care of that in the old testament, He finished it. Okay, now when you become a believer, guess what? Every curse is broken. All of them. If you just read your Bible, you'll see that. I don't care what book is out there and how popular it is and who the author is, I don't really care. It's not God, so it doesn't really matter. He's not, they're not the final authority. Every generational curse stops with the blood of Christ. Amen. Period. Now, what happens, there are generational spirits. Why? They call, we call them familial or familiar spirits. Mm. That what? They will follow families for generations. Why? Because they're eternal. They're not going anywhere until God puts them in the lake of fire. So they will follow a family. And they will find those certain proclivities that they can start speaking into and start whispering to you and start drawing you into. Why? And they'll make it seem like it's okay. They'll make us, oh, this is just normal. You go ahead and do this. It's okay. Mom did it. Dad did it. Granddad did it. Everybody does it. It's okay. Right? And that's, that's what the adage we always, your parents say, well, if, if your friends were all jumping off cliffs, you go going to jump too? And some kids are like, well, that might be kind of fun. I've seen those wingsuits. I ain't ready to fly, but I might give it a shot. Um, but you know what I'm saying? There's, there's certain things that people do just because everyone else is doing it. It's up to us to step back and take a look. You know what? I'm a child of God. I'm not part of this cycle anymore. And you have to intentionally remove yourself from that cycle or you will stay there. You have to intentionally pull out. And what you may have to do at certain times is to distance yourself from people. Okay? Wrong friends can corrupt good morals. Right? The Bible says you want to be wise? What? You go hang out with the wise. You know? It said if you lie with dogs, you're going to come up with fleas. I mean, unless you treat your dogs, you might have to worry about it. But you know what I'm saying? The idea is that you are a product of whoever you hang around the most. That, that's just reality. Because you're going to mimic what they do. In some way, somehow, it's going to come out. Think about people you hang out with a lot. You start taking on their vernacular. 
right? You'll start repeating phrases and things that they say. It'll just be, it comes out of you. You don't think about it. They do the same thing. They pick up on things you say. All right, so that's why it's so important that your realm of influence does not have a root of bitterness in it. Because that root of bitterness will corrupt. And it will begin to cloud your ability to see clear, to hear clear, and to do what God calls you to do because it's bitter. Okay, let me ask you a question. How many of y'all have ever gotten angry and held on to that anger for an extended period of time? Okay. What happened in that process? Were you able to even be able to begin to deal with the problem at all until you finally stepped back and was able to finally look at it clear? See, when you're angry, when you're emotional, you cannot see a problem clear. You will not be able to see it. Uh, I shared a post this week. I thought it was great. Talking about boiling water. When the water's still, you can see your reflection in it if it's, if it's got the right thing. But when the water's troubled, you can't see nothing. But the reflection we're supposed to be seeing, it wasn't in this post. It's supposed to be Jesus. But if your waters are troubled and you can't see clear, you need to step back and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak to this storm. Be still. Why? Because remember, Jesus rebuked Peter, not the storm first. He rebuked Peter for his lack of faith. Everybody wants to skip past that. So, well, Jesus calmed the storm. But yeah, you forget, though, he was a little bit, okay, Peter, um, you've got the ability. You've seen everything that's been done. You've been a part of everything that's been done. Why didn't you tell the storm to shut up? I'm trying to sleep, man. I'm tired. I didn't say that, but I'm thinking because he was sleeping. He had to get up because they're in panic mode over the storm. Guys, how long do I got to be with you? That's what he asked me. How long do I got to put up with you guys? Are you not getting it? Speak to the storm. Never mind, I got it. Shh. I'm going back to sleep. Some of y'all have got to learn to say, you know what? I'm going to speak to that storm, and then I'm going to let it go. Because what? I've already spoken. It's going to happen because I expect it to happen. I have faith in the Lord. It doesn't matter how big the request is. He's God. He can take care of it. But I'm doing my part by activating faith, and faith will always get what it goes for. Whether that's the negative or the positive, it will always get what it goes for. Speak to the storm. But root of bitterness. Let's go ahead and dive into the scripture. Starting in verse 1, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Now, we've been in this before. We've been in Hebrews 12 before. Um, but there's different aspects to each chapter that you can bring out. And you can go through the same chapter many, many times and pull something else out of it. Is everyone there? Yeah. Okay. Got it. All right. Now, I'm reading out of the Amplified Classic Edition this morning. So, it says, Therefore, then, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses who have borne testimony to the truth, let us strip off and throw aside every encumbrance, unnecessary weight, and that sin which so readily, deftly, and cleverly clings to and entangles us. And let us run with patient endurance and steady and active persistence the appointed course of the race that is set before us, looking away from all that will distract to Jesus, who is the leader and the source of our faith, giving the first incentive for our behalf, and is also its finisher, bringing it to maturity and perfection. He Talking about Jesus, for the joy of obtaining the prize that was set before him, endured the cross, despising and ignoring the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So what is it saying here in just these first couple of verses? One, you need to cast off everything that's holding you back. Every sin, and it also mentions weights. Weights, okay? There are things in our lives that may be good, but they're not necessary. They may be, okay, you may think, well, it's okay for me to do this, but yeah, is it helping you or holding you back? Just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. All right, that's not proper English, but I'd never press, be an English major. Whenever you start realizing all these things that I could do, they may be well, they may be good, they may benefit somebody, but right now, is it helping me run my race with Christ? Or is it a weight that's holding me back? All right, clothing is good. But if you want to sprint, you notice that they try to wear the slickest clothing that they can have, what? To get rid of, rid of the wind resistance. Swimmers, they shave. They do all these different things. So when they're in the water, they're not catching resistance so they can move faster and smoother through the water. Paul, or I believe it's Paul. Some, some would argue that. But I believe the writer here is saying, look, you need to get off all those things that's creating resistance in your life that you don't need. So get rid of all the unnecessary stuff. All right, so runners, they get down to what's necessary. Fighters, they get down to what is necessary. They will take their craft and they will whittle it down to the one, two, three things that is effective for them. Okay, Bill Wallace, he was a kickboxer back in the day. We, everybody called him Superfoot. Why? Because he ended up injuring one of his legs and he could only kick with one leg. He got so proficient with that one leg and everybody knew he was only going to hit you with the one leg. But there was not a thing they could do about it. 
He said, when you got a kick coming at you at over 70 miles an hour, what are you going to do? He, and he even said in an interview, he goes, they know it's coming. There's just not a thing they can do about it. He's right. Because he has trained it to the point where he would set them up. And he would catch them with a side kick, a hook kick, just pow, they're done. Usually pretty quick into the fight. Because what? He got rid of everything else that was holding him back to become the best that he could be. Bruce Lee said, look, I don't fear the man that's done a thousand kicks. I fear the man that's done one kick a thousand times. Why? Because he's perfected that kick. He knows that kick. And buddy, I'm telling you, if he sticks you with it, you're going to be done. I had a 14-year-old stick me with a sidekick that he'd been working on, cracked my rib. Now, I gave him a little bit too much leeway. That's on me. I should have known better just because of their age. I should have known better. But he got me with a good kick. But then he got a little arrogant, so I had to humble him a little bit. But I gave it to him afterwards. I said, man, that was an excellent kick. I said, I wasn't expecting that. Thank you for teaching me. Why? Because even as far along as I was, that little 14-year-old taught me a valuable lesson. Just because he's young, just because he's inexperienced, doesn't mean he doesn't have the ability to get one in. So you know what? I told him thank you. Some of my best lessons have come from those that were just beginning. Out of the mouth of babes, there come some amazing lessons. Don't ever knock someone's age. Don't ever knock someone's ability. But what I am telling you, as it says here, get rid of those things that are holding you back. If it's a religion and it's tradition that does not line up to Scripture, I don't care how they've tried to make that round thing fit in the square. Mm -mm. You get rid of it. If it's holding you back from walking with Jesus, you drop that thing like a hot potato and keep on moving. And don't let somebody rope you back in. Okay? Because of their nonsense. Because, well, you know, you're just doing this. And that. Mm -mm. Don't even listen to those words. Walk away. Don't even listen to that enemy. Okay? We love them, but we don't take those things in. It's not what you hear. It's what you receive. Okay? He goes on and says, Just think of him who endured for, from sinners such grievous opposition and bitter hostility against himself. Uh, reckon upon and consider it all in comparison with your trials. So what do we do? We don't compare our story to everyone else's. We compare our story to his story. Okay? And when you think about his story and what he did for you, it doesn't matter what happens in comparison. Because none of us have gone through what he's gone through. None of us have resisted sin to the point of bloodshed. And you'll see that here shortly. Actually, just going to see it right now. He goes on. <clears throat> he says, So that you may not grow weary or exhausted, losing heart and relaxing and fainting in your minds, it says. It says, You have not yet struggled and fought uh, agonizingly against sin, nor have you yet resisted and withstood to the point of pouring out your own blood. Jesus did in the garden. Okay? Resisting sin. And have you completely forgotten the divine word of appeal and encouragement in which you are reasoned with and addressed as sons? He said, have you forgotten your identity? Have you forgotten who you are? That God would call you sons, not just servants any longer, not just slaves, not just, you know, even friends. He, he's calling you now sons, children. He's acknowledging as his own. That is ownership. That the God of heaven, the creator of all, would say, you know what? You're mine. You're one of mine. You belong to me. And he asked the question, well, how quickly do you forget your identity? Does your circumstance dictate who you are? It shouldn't. But be honest, how many of you have allowed your circumstance to dictate who you are? To di dictate your value? To dictate your worth? To dictate your potential future because of what you're going through, something that's temporary right now? How many times have those things come in your life and they've allowed you to, uh, to become a setback? instead of an opportunity to actually push you forward. Because if you'll learn from something, it's not a loss, even if you fail. If you're failing forward, that means you're actually doing something. And as long as you're continuing to learn, you're going to continue to make progress. I think it was Edison, they made it like 10,000 light bulbs that didn't work. They said, well, you failed 10,000 times. He goes, no, I just learned 10,000 ways not to do it. Was it a failure? He took each oops and learned from it. Because there's always something you can learn. Always. Uh, this past week, I was sitting there looking at how I was doing my approaches when I go through the door. And I was analyzing it in my head because I, I remember well when I have a conversation. I'll go back there. I'm like, oh, I didn't say this or I didn't do this. And I realized certain things that I wasn't doing. I'm like, go back to what you know. It's been whittled down. It's the most effective. Go back to that. Stop trying to do your own thing. 
Problem comes in our walk with Christ is when we try to do our own thing instead of do his thing. Okay? So let me keep going. Don't forget your identity. Keep going into that. Because uh, what happens when you do that place, it says what you grow weary, you get tired, you get fed up, you get frustrated. I, I know in my walk as a believer, there's been times I've been frustrated. But looking back at it, most of my frustration, honestly, was with people and with religion. And when people were trying to follow their traditions over Jesus, and I, and I saw the hurt and the woundedness that was causing the people, and it frustrated me. But God said, look, you pray for them. Don't become like them. I'm like, okay. Well, let me work on that. And you know what? And through the Holy Spirit, he did. He helped me. All right, so he goes on. He says, my son, do not think lightly or scorn to submit to the correction and discipline of the Lord. Nor lose courage and give up and faint when you are reproved or corrected by him. For the Lord corrects and disciplines everyone whom he loves and he punishes, even scourges every son whom he accepts and welcomes to his heart and cherishes. You must submit to and endure correction for discipline. God is dealing with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not train and correct and discipline? Now, if you are exempt from correction and left without discipline in which all of God's children share, then you are illegitimate offspring and not true sons at all. Wow. Say, so look, if you ain't going through the, the discipline process, then you're not a son. So that's a good indication when someone's wondering about their salvation and their walk with God. Let me ask you a question. Is the Father correcting you? Is He growing you? Is He bringing discipline into your life? Say, hey, you look, you need to cut this out. You need to do this. What? Because the loving Father's going to say, look, son, this is going to hurt you. This is going to cause you problems. You need to quit. But you persist in it. The Father's going to say, hey, pow, cut it out. Not to hurt you, even though it doesn't feel good at the moment. It's to say, look, you keep doing this. What I'm doing now is going to seem like nothing in comparison to the pain you're going to get if you don't stop. Because life is a hard teacher. And it has no remorse, it has no pity. When life hits you, because you weren't wise enough and you know, loving enough to listen to those that tried to correct you, <laughs> there ain't no complaining then because you did it to yourself. But if you listen to those that love you, listen to the Father's correction and follow that and receive it and do something with it, it will result in blessing. And here's the word for it. Let's keep going. He goes, moreover, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we yielded to them and respected them for training us. Shall we not much more, much more, cheerfully submit to the Father of spirits and so truly live? For our earthly fathers disciplined us, as, or disciplined us for only a short period of time and chastised us as it seemed proper and good to them. But he, talking about the Father, disciplined us for our certain good, that we may become sharers in his own Holiness. Wow. Why? The Father wants us to turn out like Him, not like the world. Isn't that cool? That He's not limiting us. He's not saying that you can only go so far. He's doing everything He can to train us to be just like Himself. question is, will we go through the training process? I remember martial arts. That was tough. I had an old school instructor. He didn't put up with no nonsense. Okay? He said, do it this way, you do it this way. You don't do it this way, well, there's going to be repercussions for not doing it the way He told you to do it. And those repercussions were not always pleasant. All right? Um, I think I told you the story one time. I was in a hardware store and I uh, actually caught up with him. And things we used to do when we meet up in public, we would just throw a random strike to see how you were going to react. Boy, I wasn't even thinking about that. We got in the store. He's like, hey, how you doing, sir? Pow! Kicked me right in the gut. I'm like, I knew better? I knew better. It wasn't a hard hit, but it was enough to let me know, hey, you should have been aware. You should have been paying attention. And the reality is it was a good lesson. I had a flip-flop print right here. It was kind of funny because, I mean, it was just quick. Boom. But we would do stuff like that all the time. We saw each other in public just to keep our awareness up, keep our training up, keep us in practice. Now, here's the thing. We have an enemy that does not stop. We have an enemy that's out to devour us and to destroy us, and he's constantly roaming to see whom he can devour. Right? So if you leave yourself open, right, and you allow a root of bitterness to get in there, what is he going to do? He's going to take that thing and begin to tweak it. He will take advantage of any area that you're not allowing God to discipline you and correct you. And he will take, the enemy will take advantage of that. We're to give no ground to the enemy. But when we don't listen to our father's discipline, that's exactly what we're doing. We're working in rebellion. When we work in rebellion, that allows the enemy to move. It's not that you're opening a door. It's not that you're doing any of that. You, what? If you open a door, you can also close the door, right? So what do you do? I repent. <laughs> that's how you close the door. Repent. 
It's that simple. You ain't got to go through some long, drawn-out process. <laughs> Father, I messed up. And I know I messed up. I'm coming back to you. And you go back to him. And guess what? The devil's like, oh, couldn't get a hold of you. Good. Become like spiritual Teflon. All right, so let's keep going. He says, for the time being, no discipline brings joy, but seems grievous and painful. But afterwards, it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. A harvest of fruit which consists in righteousness in conformity to God's will and purpose, thought, and action, resulting in right living and right standing with God. So it goes on. So then brace up and re reinvigorate your uh, reinvigorate and set your sight, set your set right your slackened and weakened and drooping hands, and strengthen your feeble and palsy, that's a good word, and tottering knees, and cut through and make firm and plain and smooth straight paths for your feet. Yes, make them safe and upright and happy paths that go in the right direction. What? So that the lame and halting limbs may not be put out of joint, but rather may be cured, may be healed. So what is it? You be intentional about walking the straight path. You be intentional about walking that smooth path. You be intentional about getting rid of those weights and sins that so easily beset you. What? That if you were hurting, that you were wounded, what? You can be healed. If you had something that was weak in you, what? By you being disciplined, God says, look, I can take care of that at that point. Because what? You're not going to cause more injury to it by not being disciplined. When I dislocated my shoulder, I had to change up my style of fighting so my shoulder could heal. But I still had to figure out how can I be effective. So I had to make a different path. I had to make a different way. And your life, sometimes you're going to have to change your path and change your way to get to that smooth path and allow that area that needs to be healed to heal. Because it says it will be healed. That's what it just said. What? When you do this, that it may be, not might be, may be. That's, an, that's purpose. That's going to happen. Okay, did you catch that? Now, it says strive to live in peace with everybody. Boy, that could be difficult. Right? Especially driving down the road in the villages of 200. Wow. Live in peace with everybody. Honk, honk. Peace be to you, brother and sister. God bless you. I just wanted to get your attention by honking my horn to let you know, be at peace. Doesn't quite work out like that, does it? Right? If someone's, you know, flipping out and stressing out and yelling and screaming and you yell, calm down! You think that's really going to help them calm down? No. <laughs> Doesn't usually work like that, right? You yell, calm down. Next thing, now they're scared and they're mad. And you're probably going to get punched if you ain't careful. But what does the Bible say? A soft answer turns away wrath. Bring it down. If they're yelling, you come down in your tone. If they're stressed out and they're like anxious, you calm down. You bring it down to the opposite. What? This way it'll draw them back in. See? Little things. Little things. But we have to strive to be at peace with everybody. And what? And pursue that consecration and holiness without which no one will ever see the Lord. Wow. Exercise foresight and be on the watch to look after one another. To see that no one falls back from and fails to secure God's grace. His unmerited favor and spiritual blessing. In order that no root of resentment... Rancor, bitterness, or hatred shoots forth and causes trouble and bitter torment, and the many become contaminated and defiled by it. You catch that? That root of bitterness, if we're not careful, if we're not looking out for one another, can spring up in somebody and begin to contaminate many people. All right? Bitterness is contagious, guys. How many of y'all been around someone that has a negative attitude? Next thing you know, before you're aware of it, you've got the same negative attitude. Right? You've got to walk away from people like that. You've got to walk away from TV shows like that. You've got to walk away from music like that. You've got to walk away from those things that are putting that in you. Because again, what you're around, you will become. What you put before your eyes, you will start to emulate. Okay? I think I mentioned it a few weeks back, talking about the ear gate, eye gate, all that. The ways that things can enter you. Guard your gates, guys. Don't let those things in that will change you to be opposite of what you're striving for. If that means you've got to let go of supposed friends, let them go. Now, that doesn't mean you stop being friendly. That just means you have to stop being friends to the point where there's levels of influence. Does that make sense? Okay, so I want to make sure. Again, we keep loving them. We keep praying for them because if they're needing something, we can minister to them. But you've got to remember, we can't always hang out with them. And that's okay. Because sometimes there's a season you have to pull back from people. Remember, Paul separated from John Mark for a season. Why? Because John Mark couldn't get his crap together. <laughs> and Paul's like, okay, you've got to go over And you're not going with me on this journey. You haven't got some stuff together, you can't go right now. But later on, he said, hey, can you please bring John Mark? Because what? He is beneficial to me. So Paul went from saying, hey, not at this time, to hey, 
He's a blessing to me. Please bring him. I really need to see him. He's a value to me. I appreciate him. Right? So he didn't allow him to stay in that place. He just acknowledged what he was dealing with in the moment. Hey, look, you need to grow up. Then when you're ready, absolutely, we can, go, we can do this thing again together. No problem. That, that, that's how it works sometimes. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I want to go into this. And it made a whole lot of sense what the writer brought this up. He said, he says here that no one may become guilty of a sex. It's interesting of sexual vice or become a profane, godless, and sacrilegious person as Esau did. Whew. Why? Because Esau went out and married heathens. He went out and married non-covenant people just to spite his family because of bitterness that was within him. All right? And then interesting how people will use sex as a vice to go out and justify their actions or to find some type of solace and make things okay for what they're doing. It's interesting, the Bible talks about sex being the only thing that actually defiles you. Just saying. You've got to look at that. It's a big deal. All right? So let's keep going. He goes on, he says, he says for, he, for you understand that later on, when he wanted to regain uh, title to his inheritance of the blessing, he was rejected, disqualified, and set aside, for he could, not, uh, could find no opportunity to repair by repentance what he had done, no chance to recall the choice he had made, although he sought for it carefully with bitter tears. All right? Why? Because Esau sold his birthright. Well, he said, well, Jacob swindled me. No, you gave it up because of your belly. To read the story, he was famished, he was hungry, and his brother was making some good food. He said, hey, give me some of that. He goes, no, you sell me your birthright first. I'll give you my, I'll give you the, you know, I'll give you food, you give me your birthright. What's that? You give me the blessing, you give me the thing that dad's going to pour out when it's time, that I get all of that and you don't get nothing. So what did he do? He chose his belly over his birthright. Let me ask you, child of God, how often will you choose your belly, your appetites, if you will, over your birthright as a child of God? How many times will you make sacrifice for your flesh over the things of the Spirit? Will you accommodate the flesh and give up the things of the Spirit? Be careful. Because there may come a day to where there's no repentance longer available to you for that. It actually talks about that. Those that have tasted and seen, it's impossible for them to come back. Why? Because what ends up happening is you become a reprobate. You become, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, can't think of it now off the top of my head. Basically, the idea is that you become seared in your conscience. You become seared in your spirit to where you pretty much just you reject God. It's not that you lost your salvation. It's that you set it aside yourself. You can't lose something when you purposely set it aside. If I dump my cup over on purpose, I didn't lose my cup on accident. No, I put it over. The salvation that we have is predicated on Christ. And receiving it is predicated on our faith. Releasing it is also predicated on the fact that, hey, I don't want it anymore. Did Lucifer or did he not live in heaven with God for an extended period of time? Was he not a servant? What did he ultimately do? He chose, hey, I want to be God. That's what people do all the time. There are believers that were believers at one point that chose, you know what, I want to be God of my own life. Well, the moment you do that, you reject God. Okay, so this isn't a matter of losing your salvation. This is a matter of rejecting the gift that was given to you. Yes, you received it at one point. Then you chose later on, you know what, I don't really like it anymore. I like my way better. Be careful. Because sometimes there's no repentance from that. I'm not saying it's going to, because again, up until you take that last breath, there's always opportunity. Okay, because God's grace and mercy is there. But how much more difficult is for those that have tasted and seen to come back? That's what the Bible says. That's not me. All right. So I already talked about that. The story out of Jacob and Esau is out of Genesis 29, going into 29 through 34. It says, you know, at the end of that, that Esau despised his birthright and considered it beneath his notice. He despised his birthright. Why? His action shows that he despised that he despised it. How many believers say that they're believers, but their actions show completely contrary to being a believer? That, that honestly is showing that you truly despise the sacrifice that was made for you by your actions. Now, if you're growing and you're striving to be more like God, and you're striving, and yet you have a struggle. Okay, that's one thing. But it's those to say, well, I go to church, so I must be okay with God, but continue to live like hell and think they're representing Christ. Well, no, you're not representing Christ. You're representing your father, the devil. Remember, Jesus had the same conversation with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He's like, well, our father Abraham, he goes, no, I know who your father is, and it wasn't him. 
He told him. He said, your father was the devil. He's like, look, I know who your mama been with. And it wasn't God. It was the devil. Again, we can look at people's fruit. I can't judge what's going on in their soul. I have no idea. That's between them and the Lord. But I can look at the fruit. And if the fruit is constant, contrary to Christ, we need to have a conversation, especially if you say you're a believer. Now, if you're not a believer and you're doing your thing, hey, I can't say anything to you. Other than, hey, I love you. Jesus loves you. He desires more for you. He paid a high price for you. So what I can't judge anything that a non-believer does. By no means can I judge them. But if you're going to proclaim the title as believer or disciple or follower of Christ, I have a very heavy responsibility to make sure you're walking as a believer. But I have to do that in love. I have to do that in as much grace as I can. But sometimes grace isn't always friendly. Okay? Grace is not always nice. But grace is there to pick you up when you dust you off. But grace will bring correction. Amen? Okay? So grace is empowering. That's what gives us the ability to overcome sin. God bless you. All right, Genesis 27, 32 through 45, this is where Esau goes in to try to get the blessing back. He tries to go in and receive his blessing from his father because his father's getting ready to do that. Well, Jacob goes in and receives the blessing first, right? Because his mom tricked, you know, showed him, hey, this is how you can go deceive your father. Genesis 27, verse 25, or 32 through 45. I, I jumped down from uh, 29. Okay, maybe I got this backwards. Either way. <clears throat> it might be 29, 32 to 45. Yes, hold on, I'll tell you exactly what it is. Huh? All right, okay, the first one was Genesis 25, 29 through 24. The other one's Genesis 27, 33 to 46. So it should be 27. Genesis 27, 33 to 46. Okay, sorry. Sorry. But it is Genesis 27. The first one was 25. Okay, so again, this is where he went in. His father was getting ready to bless. Jacob went in, deceived his father, made himself to look and smell like Esau because Esau was a wild man, he said. He, he smelled like the field. He smelled like whatever. His mom said, look, I'll prepare the food. You go and do this. Your father won't know because he can't see real well. All right, now Esau gets there after the fact. And Isaac says, okay, well, then who was it that was here then? And Esau flips his cookies, boy, and say, well, that must have been Jacob. Isn't his name true that he is a supplanter? You know, now he's stolen from me twice. Well, no, he only stole from you once, technically. And even here, he really wasn't stealing because you gave up your birthright. You gave up your blessing. If you go back and look at it, but he's, he's even Isaac was upset about this whole situation. But I do have a question. If y'all, this is a side that has nothing to do with necessarily what we're talking about today about bitterness. But Isaac was already told that the younger would be over the, the older. It was already prophesied that that would happen. Isaac must have forgot that. Okay, but he favored Esau, but God had already said that Esau would serve his, older, his younger brother. So isn't it interesting? Sometimes we forget sometimes the, the word of the Lord, and then we try to do our own thing. Just saying. But he goes on down, and I want to, I want to catch this. Um. All right, so Isaac is telling him, says, Your blessing and dwelling shall all come from the fruitfulness of the earth and from the dew of the heavens above. By your sword you shall live and serve your brother. But the time shall come when you will grow restive and break loose, and you shall tear his yoke from off your neck. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are very near. When he is gone, I will kill my brother Jacob. Now, these words is what caused Jacob to go off into the other country. He finally got married, came back later on. But Isaac told, us, told him, he said, look, son, that bitterness that you have in you right now, when you finally get tired of that, you'll take it off. You'll break that yoke because it is a bondage. It is very limited in your life. So let me encourage you right now. If you have any type of bondage or like bitterness in you, let it go. Intentionally break it off of you because it's only holding you back. It's not hurting the other person any longer. It's not hurting the, the, the situation that you were in years ago anymore. It, it has nothing to do with what's going on with you right now. Okay? And there could be many circumstances in our life that can result in bitterness or a lack of trust. But let me tell you something. That's the devil hanging on something in you, not God. God came to set you free. He came to give you life and that in abundance, not bitterness in abundance. So whatever you're hanging on to, whatever wound you're hanging on to that's keeping you from trusting the word of God, let it go. That's just the devil holding you back from achieving your full full potential in Christ. 
and he will use whatever's necessary to keep you from reaching that. If it's unforgiveness, if it's bitterness, if it's some type of hurt or distrust because you didn't see what you thought you were supposed to see, let it go. Your experience does not dictate the truth of God. If your experience doesn't line up to the truth of God, then you need to get your experience leveled up. Not the truth of God leveled down. Okay? So let me keep going. Go over to Numbers 13 real quick. Numbers 13. So you're in Genesis. Go right. All right. Verse 23. I'm going to kind of give you the short version. This is verses 23 through 33. Mm-hmm. Yep. 13, 23 through 33. This is where the spies went into the promised land. Okay. This is where the original 12 went in. Sometimes we can pick too many people to do a job. Joshua learned from that experience. He only picked two later on. <laughs> but Moses had picked 12 to go in because he wanted to honor the society rules at that time. He wanted to honor each tribe. Well, they go in. They bring back one cluster of grapes, one cluster of grapes carried between them on a pole. Not a, a multiple clusters of grapes. You look at our clusters of grapes now, you get like four or five in a pack. They literally had to carry one cluster on a pole between them back when they left the promised land so they could prove what the fruit was that the Lord had promised them. Okay? So they had proof of the promise. They had it in their hand. Now, how many of you, I'm going to ask this question, that you've had proof in your hand of the promises of God? Okay? You've had it. All right. Hold that thought. And they brought back some pomegranates for that place was called the Valley of Eskol because of the cluster which the Israelites cut down there, and they returned from scouting out the land after 40 days. They came to Moses and Aaron and to all the Israelite congregation. Mind you, they didn't just talk to the leaders. They went to the whole congregation. All right? And they showed them the fruit. They showed them the promise of God was real. They showed them that the promise of God was legitimate, that it was absolutely amazing. It was more than they probably could have comprehended. But let's look at what they said. They told Moses, we came to the land which you sent us. Surely it flows with milk and honey. This is its fruit. But, uh-oh, right there's a problem. That three-letter word right there will disqualify it just about everything you try to do. But, the people who dwell there are strong, and the cities are fortified very large. Moreover, there we saw the sons of Anak, or giants, right? Amalek dwells in the land of the south of the Negev, then the Hittite, the Jebusite, and Amorite dwell in the hill country, and the Canaanite, all the ites were there. All right. Now Caleb quieted the people before Moses said, Let us go up at once and possess it. We are well able to conquer it. But his fellow scouts said, We are not able to go up against the people of Canaan, for they are stronger than we are. They brought, so they brought the Israelites an evil report of the land which they had scouted out, saying, The land through which we went to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the Nephilim, or giants, the sons of Anak, who came from the giants, and we were in our own sight, catch that, our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. They didn't even come in contact with anybody. It's not mentioned of actually coming into contact with anybody there. It's just what they perceived. Okay? But yet they declared the goodness of God. They declared that this is what God promised, and everything that God said was true. But, and they gave excuses as to why they couldn't go up and do it. Now, mind you, it was 10 against 2. So the majority said, no, we can't do this. But Joshua and Caleb said, no, we're well able to do this. Let's go do it. God made a promise. Let's go take it. It's ours. How many preachers have we heard over the years that profess, profess the goodness of God and the promises of God and everything else, but then they'll turn right around in the same sentence and negate the promises of God? Say, well, that's only for such and such, or that's only if you do this. That's only, you cannot find that in the scripture. Well, that was reserved for this group of people. That's not in the Bible. That's because of your, your personal history where you messed up or you couldn't get the job done or you're stuck, stuck in a cycle of tradition that has that philosophy because someone couldn't get the job done. Well, the scripture must be wrong and my experience must be right. Uh, no. Your experience is wrong. You were lied to and you believed the lie. And now you made that a doctrine and you teach that to other people. Remember what Jesus said about those that lead the little children astray. He said it'd be better for a millstone to be tied around their neck and them cast into the sea than to cause one of my little ones to stumble. Get the whole word of God, not a partial word of God. And when you get the whole word of God, hang on to it. Don't allow your promise that you had in your hand to be taken away from a lie that somebody tells you. 
And just because the majority is saying it doesn't make them right. You may be the only voice that stands up in your family and says, no, this is how it's going to be. You have to stand. You may be the only voice in a church congregation that says, no, that's not what the Bible says. And you're going to have to stand. You don't just go with the flow. If it's the word of God, then you stand on the word of God. Now, just because it rubs you the wrong way doesn't mean it's wrong. It means you're wrong. But when you know it's the word of God and someone's preaching contrary to the word of God, you can just say, hey, excuse me. Um, mm -mm. No, no. That's not how that works. But make sure you've got the word of God to stand on, not just your opinion. Okay? If you're going to rebuke somebody and you're going to correct them, <laughs> make sure you've got your stuff together. All right? Again, this is where we as believers, we should hold other believers accountable. Not out of, hey, I'm better than you. Absolutely not. That's where the Bible says you think you should not think more highly of yourself than you ought. When you think you're better than somebody, that's when you're thinking more highly than you should. Acknowledging who you are in Christ, no, you're not thinking more highly of yourself. You should acknowledge who you are in Christ. That's what allows you to walk all over the devil when you know who you are, okay? Yeah. Right, so now Numbers 14, just go over one chapter, 1 through 10, this is where all the, they're all crying out, losing their mind because, you know, Joshua and Caleb, hey, let's go do this. And they're like, no, no, no. And they get to the point where they want to stone Joshua and Caleb. The Lord actually intervenes. Okay. But that bitterness that they had in their own mind and that perception they had of themselves in their own mind, did you see how it quickly it, it got to everybody in the congregation and it riled everybody up? Have y'all paid attention to the news lately? And the different tactics that have been going on, it's riling people up and dividing people and all these things. They're all distractions, but it's bitterness that somebody has in their heart that they get someone else to agree with. The next thing you know, everybody's repeating the same thing. And it's against this particular group or that particular group or this particular you know, ideology. Now it's, we're becoming Christian nationalists. I don't know if y'all have seen that. To where the, we are the greatest threat now to democracy. Yeah, oh yeah, it's crap that's going on. Because what? We stand for truth. We stand for freedom. We stand for equality, but we just don't tolerate a sin. You believe what you want to believe. That's fine. But we're not going to pat you on the back and celebrate your, your sinfulness. We're not going to do that. If you want to do it, great. Go ahead. Don't ask us to participate. But because we don't want to participate, we're in the wrong. And because we will speak up against it, they think, well, you're judging me. No, I'm not judging you. I'm just telling you it's going to destroy you. But look at your life. I don't have to bring Christian into it. Look at the quality of your life because of the choices you've made. What has happened to your body? What has happened to your mind? What has happened to your emotions? You, I can take God completely out of it and still prove that you're wrong. Just because of what's happening in you. You're warring against your very nature. If you don't believe in God, that's fine. But you believe in nature? Good. Let's look at nature. If that's what you believe in, let's look at nature. You operate outside of the natural law. What happens to those animals? They are killed or they die off or they're no longer around. That's what happens in nature. Okay, God says, look, you're supposed to be above that, but if you want to operate in that, that's what you're going to get. But what he tells us as believers in Romans 1, that whenever we applaud them and we give them celebration for what they're doing, we're just as guilty. We're not supposed to do that. While I will love people to have their own lifestyle choices, great. I cannot applaud you. I cannot celebrate you. Because what you're doing is going to destroy you, and I value you over what you're doing. If someone's in a burning house or they're going over a cliff, my response is, hey, look, you're going to die if you keep doing this. Even if you don't believe in spiritually death, you will die physically just because of the emotional toll it takes on people. And again, this isn't me being mean. You look at it for yourself. Take an unbiased step back. Get out of the Kool-Aid. Take a step back and look at what actually happens in their lives. Okay? That's where God had to step in because of bitterness in the whole congregation to save somebody. Bitterness can destroy a congregation. That's what, that's what causes most church fellowships to split. If somebody got bitterness in them, mm -hmm. or an ego, which was still a result of bitterness and selfishness, that caused, hey, they talked to this person, and they talked to this person, and they talked to this person. Whenever we started this fellowship, I made it very clear, if you're going to come here, be sure it's God. If not, I don't want you here. Plain and simple. I love City Light. That's my people. I love them. Okay? But I just knew that God had a different path for us, a different way of ministry, a different way of reaching people. And I had to honor that. But I could not honor that attending there. That would have been dishonoring to what God was doing there. And I will not do that. 
And that's why I said, if you're going to come here, you seek the Lord. And if the Lord calls you, hey, please, we'll welcome you. Come on. But make sure it's God. Don't leave this for whatever. Make sure it's God. If he calls you here, then come get plugged in and serve. Right? That same rule applies. Come get plugged in and serve. Why? Because that's what's going to build this fellowship. But not just the fellowship. It's going to build our impact in the community. It's going to build our ability to reach more people and to love more people. Because if you're blessed by the message that's here, then someone else will be blessed by it as well. Okay? It's not right for us to sit on something that God is doing in our life and not share it with somebody else. I get in a conversation with people, I can't help it. It all starts coming out. Whenever God's, if God's moving to me, it's going to come out. And you, you might get stuck with me for an hour, two hours. It don't depends how long you'll put up with me. But I get excited. I'm like a little kid with a new toy, man. I'm like, you're going to see my new shiny thing. Yeah. You ain't getting it, but I'm going to share it with you. Right? It's my shiny thing. But I want you to know about it so you can go get your own shiny thing. Right? But are you excited about what God is doing? If he's changing you, if he's working in you, and you're excited about it, you're going to talk about it. I have to ask, though, if, if, if you're not excited, then what are we doing? Is it on us? Is it something we're doing? Or is it something that you're working through? But either way, we need to know so we can come alongside one another to help one another. This isn't a put down one or the other. It's to how can we build each other, right? Because if what I'm doing as a leader is not impacting you in a, the positive direction to draw you to Christ, I'm not doing my job. Okay, but if you are being impacted and you, you are growing and you are seeing the Lord move in your life and you're not sharing, then you're not doing your job. Well, I don't know how to share. Do you know how to talk to people? Do you tell them about life events in your life? How many of you on Facebook? Oh, this happened. You can take two minutes or five minutes and put this post on Facebook about everything and every, anything. But how many of you are talking about Jesus? I'm just saying. Something to challenge you with. But that bitterness comes from this. Go to Luke 9. I'm trying to get through this. I'm not going to rush, but I am trying to get through this. This was heavy on me because I know this happens so often in people's lives. And I was, I was talking with somebody because of a situation that happened in their life. And this happened a little while back, but they still have a deep, deep-seated bitterness in their heart and unforgiveness towards a loved one. And it's keeping them divided. And it's someone they're supposed to be close with, like super close with. And it, because of what happened, again, there, there was a definite wrong, a definite failing on the other person. But I know life happens sometimes. And sometimes, it's, no matter how much you try, it's, things still happen. But this created such a wound that you can, I mean, you can look at them and see it affecting them physically. And that hurts me. I don't know about them, but that hurts me when I see that. And, I, and I, I was trying to encourage my look, you really need to start working on forgiveness. It's not for them, it's for you. Because you're not going to fully heal until you let that go. Because you're going to constantly hang on that, and the devil's going to constantly use that to bring back animosity, anger, distance. But because you've made it somehow about you, the devil's using that to keep you bitter, to keep you angry, to keep you frustrated. And you're meant to be free. Even in that hurt, you can still be free. You may never fully get over it. But you can operate a whole lot better when you walk in forgiveness. But again, what happens and where this stems from, Luke 9 says this, verse 23, and this is Jesus speaking. He said, and he said to all, if any person wills or is determined or is purposed to come after me, let him deny himself, disown himself, forget, lose sight of himself and his own interest, refuse and give up himself. Those, that selfishness nature that was within us. He says, look, you want to follow me? You're going to have to let that go. Why? Because he knows what you're going to face. He knows what's going to come against you. And if you have any part of self left in you, it's going to impact it and make it very difficult for you to follow. Okay? Because what did we just read back in Hebrews 12? That he despised the shame. Because he was rejected. He was abused. He was ultimately murdered. But what? He was able to look out and forgive this to those that were doing the murdering. He was able to look out in love. Why? Because he set his own interest aside. He said, nevertheless, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus set aside his will for the Father's will. And what? That allowed him to love and to see clear. Right? Everyone else's water was boiling, but Jesus' water was crystal clear. It was smooth. He could see what was going on. When you operate in and out of and through love, you will always be able to see clear. But when you operate out of emotions... And I mean the emotions that aren't filtered through Christ, you will not be able to see clear. I'm just telling you. 
You will make judgments, and most of them rash decisions, because of an emotional moment that you're in, because you have not denied yourself. Now, it doesn't mean we can't get angry. The Bible says it's okay to be angry. But it says what? To sin not. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Settle it before the day is over. If you can't settle it before the day is over, just let it go. It's not worth it at that point. But know how to settle it. But if you settle it in love, there is righteous anger. There is righteous indignation. That's fine. It will help you get the job done because that may be the motivator for you to finally do something. Remember, Jesus cleaned the temple twice. All right, that was righteousness. It was done rightly. All right, people didn't like it, but it was done in righteousness. Maybe you need to clean your own temple. Maybe you need to get some righteous indignation about some things that are going on in you you need to clean out. Okay? He said, you must do that and take up his cross daily and follow me. Cleave steadfastly to me. Conform wholly to my example in living and, if need be, in dying also. Whenever Jesus passed the cup, that's what he was saying. <clears throat> that whatever I'm going to go through, you're willing to go through. Okay, so when he was at the communion table passing that cup, that's what the significance of the cup was. Like when you drink of this cup, you're drinking of everything that's a part of this cup. My life, my persecution, my suffering, and ultimately my death is what you're saying yes to. Okay? When, we're, when we partake of the communion cup, we're taking part of that. But we also take part of what? The victory. When we take part of that cup, we're also celebrating the victory that Jesus gave us through the whipping post, through the covenant of the cross and the blood that was shed. That's what we're saying yes to. We've got to say yes to all of it. You don't get to say yes to one part of it. We say yes to all of it. And we don't get to pick and choose. All right? <clears throat> so that's what he says. If you want to follow him, that's what you have to do. He said, forever would preserve his life and save it will lose it and destroy it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will preserve and save it from the penalty of eternal death. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and ruins, it, ruins or forfeits or loses himself? Or the Bible would say soul. Your mind, will, and emotions. So there is a difference between your spirit and soul. They are separate. Now, we've, we've merged the two words, but they are separate. Okay? The Lord can absolutely redeem your spirit, and your spirit be completely fine. But your soul can be jacked up because of things going on. Okay? But I'm not going to get into that. It's a teaching for another time. <clears throat> Romans 8, you don't have to go there. It's where the Bible talks about those that have their mind set on the things of the flesh constantly. What? Is death. But those who have their mind set on the things of the spirit is life. Whenever you try to hold on to your rights and your, who you think you are, that will bring that. That's what allows for bitterness. That's what allows for wounds. That's what allows for all those things to take place in you. But when you have your minds on the things of the spirit and the things of God and you're operating out of agape love, it doesn't matter what you go through. It will not be able to stick. The enemy will not be able to put that seed of bitterness in you, that root of bitterness. In, it will not have a place to go. Okay? It doesn't mean it won't happen to you. It just won't be able to get in you. All right? Water on the outside of the boat's not the problem. Water inside the boat is. All right? That's what causes things to sink. Whenever you're filled with the Spirit, you keep the water on the outside. Okay? You keep the thing that can cause you to sink on the outside. So that's Romans 8, 5 through 8. You can go back and look at it if you don't already have it highlighted. But where I really want to focus at, and this is where I'm going to finish out this morning, 1 Peter chapter 4, starting in verse 1. <clears throat> Let me know when you get there. First Peter 4. All right, everybody's there. I'm going to actually switch over to this. All right, so verse 1 <clears throat> says, Therefore, if that's there, you go back and look a little bit, okay? Since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose. And then there's what he says to arm yourself with. Purpose. You need to have a purpose in your life. You need to have something that you are striving for. All right, how many of you have goals in here? How many of you have something that you're looking to achieve, that you're going after? Okay, that's what you arm yourself with, is that purpose. Because what that'll do is that'll start excluding all the other things. Remember what we said in the very beginning? Set off those weights and sins. When you have a purpose, that will start that process of eliminating the weights and things that hold you back. Okay? Let's keep going. Because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. All right? So, you have to take care of the flesh. And as you do that, what? It says, 
he has suffered in the flesh, has ceased from sin. What does that mean? You're not stuck always being a sinner. You cannot be a sinner and a saint. It doesn't work like that. I'm not a sinner saved by grace. You're right. You're not a sinner saved by grace. You cannot be a sinner saved by grace. I'm just a sinner. You're either you're a sinner or you're saved. Which is it? You can't have both. You're one or the other. All right? You have the ability to sin. does not make you a sinner. I feel like I need to keep repeating that. I don't know why. Somebody get your identity straight. Whoever that's for, get that straight. Your ability to do something does not make you that thing. Okay, just because you can drive a car doesn't mean you're a car. It also doesn't mean you're a race car driver. Some people like to think they are, but they're not. All right, your ability to do something does not make you that thing. Okay, so people got to lift up different types of weights. Does not make you a weight lifter? Right? If you do it consistently, that becomes part of your nature. Okay, then you can say you're a weight lifter. But if it's a part-time thing, that's not who you are. It's not what you are. Okay? But even that, it's still not what you are. Who you are is who you are in Christ. That's your identity. Okay? Your ability, that's a gifting. Your identity is found in Christ and in Him, through Him, and that you're supposed to look like Him. We got restored back to the image. Okay? Let me keep going. Get me off on a side trail. Stop it. Don't get me in trouble. All right. Since for the time already passed is sufficient for you to have carried out the desires of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable adulteries. In all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you, but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. Say, look, you can no longer live in that same lifestyle you lived in to think it's okay. And the fact is, when you start stepping out, those that you used to run with, they're going to judge you. They're going to ridicule you. They're going to say, oh, you're no fun anymore. You're weak. You're this. You're that. The reality is, you're actually getting stronger. You're getting better. You're becoming whole. All right? Because if you look at the people that run in those things, they run in the things of the flesh. They're suffering. They're not really happy. They're happy in the moment that they're doing what they're doing, but it doesn't last. Why? That's why they got to go drink again. That's why they got to go to this, have sex again. That's why they got to go do all these things again outside of the way things are supposed to operate. Why? Because they're satisfied in the moment, and then that feeling dissipates. Right? We got to go back to the party so everybody can look at me. What? They're getting the pats on the back, they're getting the accolades. It feels good in the moment. But what happens as soon as they leave the party? They can't wait till the next one. So the what? They can be recognized again. It feeds all the selfish things that go on in the body and in the mind, the flesh. That's what it's talking about. All those things that are represented in that list is according to the flesh. He says, look, you had a time for that, but that's long past. You had enough time to get that done. Let's cut it out. Right? It's time to grow up. Verse 7. He says, why? The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound mind or sound judgment and a sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. That keeps us what? From judging. It says, be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. What is that? If you have a gift, use it to bless others. Don't hang on to it for yourself. That's what that's talking about. Everybody has a different gifting. All right, Everybody has things that they're good at and they'll excel at. Some of y'all can sing. Thank God. Because a lot of us can't. We try. But man, it sounds like a donkey brand. It's not good. But some of y'all, man, y'all can carry a melody that's absolutely amazing. It is a, and it blesses others. Okay? Some of you can play and do the things and it just... It, that's amazing. Use it for the kingdom. Use it to bless others. That gift wasn't given to you for you to sit on it. Use it. Some of you are like, you know what? I think I could. I just haven't put forth the effort. Okay, then put forth the effort. And see what God will do to bless it. All right, this is the idea of getting plugged into a ministry. If you have a gift, get plugged in use it. Now, I'm not saying get in and burn yourself out because you're just not quite there yet and letting the Spirit operate out of you and through you. But use your gift to see if God won't multiply it. And increase it and develop it. Okay? Again, okay, it's a shameless plug. We want people that can do these things to serve because it blesses others. All right, some of y'all can teach. You may not know it yet, but you have the ability to teach. You're already doing it, and other people are receiving the fruit of it, but you haven't recognized it yet. Okay? 
Start using that. God will multiply it. All right? You may not necessarily be up here doing it. I wish somebody else would. It'd be great. Right? Um, because I like to listen too. Not as much as I like to share, I like to listen. But God gifted me to do this. Not what I wanted, I promise you. I was good being back in the back, not in the way looking at me. I was like, yeah. God said, no. He said, no, you're going to tell people, you're going to talk to people. I'm going to, what? And you're going to talk in front of people. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, nope. Wrong guy. I don't like people very much because I'll teach you to love them. And it'll have to be you. That's a lot of work because I don't like people's drama. I still don't like people's drama. I'm going to be honest. I don't like people's drama because a lot of times they do it to themselves and I just have a low tolerance for that because to me it's foolish and people, because of foolishness, hurt other people. I just, I think it's the protective nature in me that I have, I have issues with it. But like I said, if I sat on this gift, I, can't, I couldn't sit on it. I try to sit on it. I get antsy. And I start, my wife's like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, I don't know. Because I'm not doing what I need to be doing. And that's ultimately what it is. So, and you, you're probably antsy right now because you're not doing what God's called you to do. Just to kind of throw that out there. You're not fulfilling what God has purposed in you to start doing. He's already spoken to you and you're just not doing it. I, I don't know what else to tell you. God's gifts and callings are without repentance. And I feel like Jeremiah, by sitting on it, it becomes like a fire shut up in your bones. Sooner or later, it's going to come out. Why wait? Let the goodness be contagious, not just the bitterness, okay? All right, let me go on. He goes on and says, you know, those that, uh, blah, 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 verse 11, whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Wow. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. So how are we supposed to serve? And the strength which God supplies. So that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Now, beloved, that's all. Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. What is that? Don't like, where did this come from? Sometimes you do stupid things, right? And you got to deal with it. Other times the enemy does stupid things. You've already conquered it. Other times there's a saying, hey, I'm going to see where you're at. I'm going to push you a little bit. My instructor, when I was learning martial arts, he would push me. What does that mean? He's going to step up his game, so I have to step up my game. So when we were sparring, he would go a little bit beyond what I was capable of handling to see what I had in me, to see if I would stretch to that next level. Okay? That was a good thing, to prove what was there. Maybe I didn't realize it was there, but that little bit of pushing that he gave me proved that it was there. That's what a good coach will do, right? A good coach will bring out of you what you didn't even think you had in you. My job as a minister, as a pastor, preacher, is to bring out of you what you don't think is in you. Because what I'm telling you is the Word of God, and the Word of God is true, and it's, it's alive, and it's living. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting the sword between the soul and the spirit. If that's getting into you right now, and it's beginning to separate the two, he's going to start revealing, hey, this is what's in you. You need to do something with it. You're capable of more of what you think you are, and I've already put it in you, and you already know it's there. You felt the nudge, and you felt the urging. Get off your butt and do something. Right? It's not to say, hey, look at me. No, hey, look at God, because if it wasn't for God, I wouldn't be doing this. Right? If it wasn't for God, I promise you, I wouldn't be up here in front of everybody. It's God. All right, he goes on. He says, but to the degree that you share the servants of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or a thief or evildoer or troublesome, troublesome meddler, uh, but if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this, in this name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. Where does it start? Uh, right. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Bitterness will hinder you from doing these things. Bitterness will keep you from operating in the gifts that God has placed within you. He will give you justification, rationalization, and everything else to keep you from walking in the fullness of what God has. And here's what he'll do. He'll work through you, and then you'll start complaining to somebody else. And you'll start bringing them down. And they'll get that, then they'll start bringing somebody else down. Do not allow bitterness in you to become bitterness in somebody else. Now, here's the other thing. Don't let someone else's bitterness become bitterness in you. 
Okay, be filled with the Spirit and it'll leave no place for bitterness. Okay, don't allow their nonsense to become your nonsense. Right, the other idea of taking up the cross is to never allow sin against you to become sin in you. All right, that's the big deal about that because if you're dead, what can they do? They can't do anything to you. You can go to the graveyard and cuss those people out and do whatever you want to them. What, they're not going to say anything? No. Right? And they're like, hey, cut that out. And they go back to the, that ain't what they're going to do. It ain't going to hit them that way. But it also needs to be to a place where you're not even flattered either. Okay? Because people can flatter you right into hell. So it should get to a place where the only compliment you're worried about is what the Father says. And boy, the Father has said so much good about you, how could anybody else can compare what has the ability to draw your ear like that and get your attention? Hopefully it's only the Father's words, the Father's blessing, because He has already blessed you with every spiritual blessing. He sings over you. I mean, come on. We have a Father that has a good voice that sings over us. He blesses us with every spiritual blessing. That's love. And He's always doing that. He, his blood speaks a better word over us. So guys, I hope this morning that you got something out of this, that you will step away from bitterness in your life. Stop allowing it to come into your life. If someone's bitter, pray for them. So you know what? I can see you're hurting right now. Can we pray? So what? You stop that off right there. You, you cut it off at the pass. Or let them know, hey, look, if you're going to continue in this, I won't be able to hang out with you. I'm going to continue to pray for you. I'm going to continue to love you, but I cannot be around this. Because if you're just not able to receive, I'm going to keep praying for you. But I'm not going to allow that to come into me. Now, if you know that it can't get into you, then do whatever it takes to get them well. All right? But if you're at a place where you're not 100%, keep trusting God, step back. But if you know if God's got you and you're solid in your faith in that, then there's nothing that can hit you. You go in there and you do battle with them. Okay? I'm just I'm trying to cover both sides because some people just don't have that faith to step into that. And there's nothing wrong with that. You'll get there. It's like me dealing with people that are sick. I'm not worried about catching it. I don't care what you got. It doesn't faze me. But if you're not there yet, that's okay. Know where you are. But as you grow, learn to step into it. You know what? That crap ain't going to touch me. I'm going I'm to get the job done. Okay? It doesn't matter what it is. But bitterness in your life will destroy you. But it also destroys those that we love. So let's make sure we're very aware of that. Let's make sure we don't allow it to take us out of the promises of God. Let's trust the promises. Not worry about the bitterness and the defeat, okay? All right, let's pray, and we're going to stand and worship. So, Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this time. We thank you for this.